Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome all those who join us on our Heritage.org website on these occasions. I would ask everyone here in-house to be so kind to check cell phones that they have been turned off as we prepare to begin as a courtesy to our speakers. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage immediately following today's presentation for everyone's future reference as well. And our Internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our program today is Hella Dale, our Senior Fellow for Public Diplomacy in the Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign and National Security Policy. She is also a Media Fellow at the Hoover Institution, serves on the Board of Visitors at the Institute on Political Journalism and the Center for Free Inquiry at Hanover College in Indiana, and is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, please join me in welcoming Hella Dale. Hella? Thank you, John. And thank you very much to all of you for coming here today. <clears throat> when uh, I told our uh, organi organizers here that we were going to have a program on the first day back after the Thanksgiving break, um, I always hear that, well, that's not a time when you can get many people to come because everybody's just coming back into town. Well, uh, our audience attendance today shows us something about the level of interest that there remains here in Washington on the issue of the future of Ukraine. Um, the battle for the future of Ukraine rages on, and despite a ceasefire negotiated in Minsk, um, in Donetsk and Luhansk in eastern Ukraine, separatists supported by Russia continue to fight against Ukrainian forces. It is a bloody and protracted conflict that we do not get covered enough here in the United States. We are very fortunate, however, today to have um, a young man who covers this on an almost daily basis for many of us who are fortunate enough to be connected with him, Nikolai Vorobyov, who is a Ukrainian journalist. He came from there within the last week. Yeah. Yes? Before Thanksgiving. Before Thanksgiving, yes. Yeah. Um, he is associated with the Center for Eastern European Perspectives in uh, Kiev, and he is also a blogger, and he has his own investigative website. Nikolai has been on the ground in eastern Ukraine since this spring, uh, firsthand taking a look at the struggle between the Russian and Ukrainian forces, the political situation, and all the other things going on there. We are. Um, extremely fortunate to have him here today. Our second speaker will be um, Peter Doran, who is the Director of Research at the Center for European Policy Analysis, where he also heads the Center's Eastern Lights and Energy Horizons programs. Uh, Peter is also just almost fresh off the plane um, from that part of the world, uh, so he also has some very interesting perspectives coming from you in Georgia? Georgia. Yes. Uh, he has previously worked at the Jamestown Foundation and at Freedom House as a Central Eastern Europe analyst. And he served as a Foreign Affairs Fellow in the US Congress and as a George C. Marshall Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. So welcome to Peter. Our final speaker um, will be the Heritage Foundation's own Luke Coffey. He is our Margaret Thatcher Fellow uh, in the Thatcher Center for Freedom here at the Heritage Foundation. Before coming to Heritage, Luke was an advisor to the British Ministry of Defense under Foreign, uh, sorry, Defense Secretary Liam Fox, Defense Minister Liam Fox. He was also an advisor to the British Conservative Party on Security and Defense Affairs. He's an American, uh, and I believe he is probably the only American ever to hold positions like this in the UK Ministry of Defense. He is a NATO expert and um, has many insights into Ukraine's future vis-a-vis -vis NATO. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our first speaker. Um, Nick, you can sit or you can stand, whatever makes you feel comfortable. Uh, well, stand at what will be much better. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Nick Nikolai Mikola, so 
whenever you want. Uh, thanks, Helen. Thanks uh, the Heritage Foundation for these possibilities to hold a speech here on the current events in Ukraine. And I will be really glad to share you with my like insights, with my own view. So I work as a journalist in Ukraine like for last science six years. And for the during science May to uh, November, I spent around six week, weeks in battlefield in the eastern Ukraine. And well, so I would like to share you with, with this information. Maybe I will start start with some preview about the the grounds of this conflict. Unfortunately, we don't have a presentation here because of the, some technical facilities. But feel free. I will leave my contacts. You, you, you uh, I can email it to you. So it, just to to for visualization. Uh, let's get started. So uh, the five main facts about the, this really war and declared war uh, in eastern Ukraine, despite uh, the media become more not, not so more quiet on the situation in eastern Ukraine, the conflict is escalating right now in this moment. So the first, this is the most mythical and strange shadow and declared war in uh, um, an entire world history probably. The second is the most brutal war in Europe since World War II. Because uh, uh, we were, as you know, we were engaged in Afghanistan war uh, during the Soviet time. And I, I interviewed a lot of veterans from that war who are now fights for uh, Ukrainian integrity in eastern Ukraine. So they told me that it was a honeymoon for them. So all Taliban they had, it was only like, it were only uh, maybe some Kalashnikov machine guns and some like supplies for like uh, US, I don't know for where exactly, I'm not expert, but now pro-Russians, well, I would like to call them terrorists, but like to be more objective, let's, let's leave it's like pro-Russian separatists. Now they use like multi-missile uh, Grad, Huragan and like multi-missile launches, including which was uh, one of them from which of was uh, shot uh, down this uh, MH17 plane. So you can imagine this, uh, how equipped they are. The third fact is uh, the most unique war because all people, like 90% of the nations uh, for Ukrainian army from volunteer battalions comes from, uh, comes from like regular just volunteers. People literally feed their army. So they send the food, they send equipment, and they even just make some reconstruction of uh, uh, destroyed vehicles. So this is also true. So this is like people's war. And uh, this is uh, the first evidence probably right now, the, the first scale evidence right now of terrorism in Europe, you know, but I, I, to my mind, uh, if the conflict will be froze, frozen, we will have the next ISIS in the Central Europe. And uh, the, the, the last point is this is the most like tricky war and undeclared, despite like number of casualties. Uh, well, I want just to express my own view. I mean, I don't represent any like political organization here and all of views are my own from the ground. But to my... Uh, uh, well, to my according to my data, we've lost about 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers killed there, about 10,000. So we've lost less in uh, Afghanistan war for 10 years. That's why official number says about 1,200, but I think it's like at least eight times more. And the, despite this is the most brutal conflict in, in Europe since World War II, uh, it, it's, un, it's still undeclared. So what we have on the ground right now, who fights on that side? Probably it would be interesting for you. So when we are talking about pro-Russian separatists, it's actually not true. According may, maybe uh, the same to my data, I interviewed like people like including like uh, captured separatists from that side. Also, I, I told to the commanders of our volunteers battalions. So uh, probably 20% of them are locals. So uh, in Eastern Ukraine on that side. So, uh, um, well, we have to, to, be uh, to be aware. So that's if uh, some conflict takes place, somebody wants to benefit from this. So uh, including this 20%, maybe some like, uh, cre actually they are criminals, you know, people who want to benefit from the conflict, who want to use the situation for their own like 
uh, to, to get something, at least maybe to capture somebody's business or house or car or something like this. Also, we have another like category with around like maybe 40%, I call them mercenaries. Is it fine? Is it pronunciation? Is mercenaries? So actually, the scenario was realized. The same scenario was realized in Georgia, uh, in, in in Georgia and Transistria. Uh, uh, when I'm talking about mercenaries, I mean uh, people from Caucasus. So we actually we call them Chechens, but I don't Chechens don't like it because like uh, we know the Chechnya, they fall, they they've been fought for their ind independence for a long time. So I, I, uh, these people are affiliated with Kadyrov, with the current president uh, uh, of uh, Chechen Republic. So all of them, they are mercenaries. Uh, they are professionals. They don't care where to fight, for against whom to fight, and where and exactly. So all they do is just to kill people. And also on that side, we have um, the, the next category is like Russians, Cossacks. They were also very active in Georgia war in 1992-1993, in 2008, and everywhere where something happens, Cossacks are there. So uh, they are from well, they, they are in Ra they based in Rostov, and just to dis uh, they just consider themselves like like real Russian warrior. They try to preserve their like Orthodox heritage and Christianity and something like this. But actually, I mean. Uh, what they do, and they consider Eastern Ukraine as their land. So, well, they say that we are uh, ideologically here. To, to, so this is our ideology, and it's our ideals to fight here against so-called junta in Kiev and fascist regime. But uh, all they do is just, I, I know that they drink a lot, for sure, mm -hmm. and all they do just like also try to take somebody's business and when I've heard this real story where somebody are, is fine, I mean, just when he, 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 he took enough like cars or some another estimate property, they don't want to fight in the front line, you know, so they stay in checkpoint and doing their business. So uh, there are a lot of conflicts in th inside so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People Republic because you can imagine people from different backgrounds with different goals and with different like ambitions want to take more. And of course, for sure, there is a regular Russian army. I think it's about maybe 20, 25 percent. Uh, maybe somebody like, uh, well, Russians like to ask me where, for how, how do I know this? Well, first I was on the ground. I told uh, I was not far from Donetsk airport, which is a PSK. This is a lit little village. It was it's one kilometer from the hottest uh, place in eastern Ukraine. So, it, and the battle probably is happening right now. And uh, I told to, to talk to soldiers from volunteer battalions from Ukrainian side for regular army. And there are two clear evidences, uh, probably three. The first is uh, the tra uh, are the trophies. Well, we have like some signs of Russian army of some re uh, regular Russian division. So each uh, sign sh can be only or either on their uniform or their well. Some if they capture somebody or kill somebody from on the Russian side, uh, it could found it could be found on their bodies. So this is like sort of tattoo, very famous among Russian paratroopers, which says that there he he is from that division. And the third is, of course, about like uh, our intelligence and about this some recorded like uh, speech in their cell phones, and of course an enormous uh, number of Russian equipment. For example, I have some pictures I can show you then, uh, where I hold like this machine Kalashnikov machine gun, which was produced, for example, in Russian. I have I have a bullet. It's like my own souvenir. Unfortunately, I couldn't bring it here. But it's a bullet from Vyklop. <laughs> yeah, I've tried, but no, <laughs> not a good idea. Uh, it calls Vyklop. So um, I don't know how to translate it, but it's a modern uh, Russian sniper uh, uh, sniper machine gun. So it takes like. For example, the, the, I, I, if there are any experts on uh, military stuff and weapon, yeah, maybe you, you know, are, are here somebody from like this military or some like equipment? So maybe no, somebody knows. Okay, I would like just to compare. So there is a um, one um, 
machine gun which calls dra Dragoon of for sniper, okay? And it takes for 800 meters. So, so the most effective distance just to, to, uh, to get the target is 800 meters. And when we are talking about this Vihlap, like this Russian produced, it takes at least like two miles. And it takes any armory. So when I wear my like uh, uh, body armor there in Pesky near the Donetsk airport, they they, uh, they just advised me to leave it. You know, there is no sense. You are not too mobile. But I, I, can I ask some questions? Yeah, no problem. About this of, uh, thing. It was produced in middle. Uh, it's Soviet. 60, so yeah, it's, it's a Soviet. It's old it, Soviet. It, it was also in Ukraine. But yeah, th this is true, and it is. And it is, it is in Ukraine. 80% of our equipment, and why I want also to em emphasize this, 80% of our equipment technique, it's like 16, 17 years old. That's why, including radio stations, that everything. So what we used, it's like, like from our Soviet heritage. So of, co of course we have some our modernized uh, t uh, vehicles or something like in, uh, which was produced in, in our factories, but yeah, for sure we use this uh, weapon and including armor uh, body armors, which is like 30, 40 years old. Mm -hmm. Moreover, I can. No, no, you, you didn't understand me correctly. So the Dragunov is the old one. I'm talking about Vihlap. I'm talking about the modernized, which was captured from that side. And this is Soviet is really just, yeah, of course, it's, it's thanks for the question. It's really, it, it, it has sense because like, uh, it's really, um, Dragunov is, is really common. You can find it everywhere. But the new one, like which takes like two miles, we don't have it in the Ukrainian army at all. So, and I, I, I can show you the bullet uh, in my, uh, um, yeah, okay, I understand. Um, and the, the next is, uh, the next important, so who fights on the Ukrainian side? Uh, so the, uh, the average number of uh, Ukrainian troops on the ground in the eastern Ukraine is about 60,000 soldiers. Uh, including uh, plus 10,000 uh, people from volunteer battalions. So what it means? So uh, we have around maybe 15 volunteer battalions, which is like right sector, Dnipro, uh, Dnipro, Donbass, and so on. The people who were organized just to fight for their own land, and they don't want to be, a, a, or they couldn't be in regular Ukrainian army with, with, with different reasons. Uh, so... <coughs> I've interviewed several times the leader of volunteer battalions, which is right sector. Have you heard something about right sector? The most mythical organization, like in Russian media, so they consider that so, like Russians uh, like to consider them like a, a neo-Nazi and people who just you know. So this is really famous, and according to the last research, uh, they mentioned it. Uh, right sector gains more m mentions, mm -hmm. like. Uh, little bit less mentions than uh, the main Russian uh, political party, which is United Russia, you know. So <laughs> this is, this, they get a lot, great promotion. And they also had around, well, I, I don't know for sure exactly how many soldiers fight in the right sector, but like hundreds. And people go there with different reasons. For, for example, if uh, he or she, actually, we have maybe like 10% who are women there. Uh, the right sector is not registered. Uh, just for example, uh, despite for example, we have some volunteering battalions which are registered. Is it it, it belongs either to uh, defense ministry or to ministry of interior interior ministry? But right sector, for example, they are not registered, and uh, all the weapon they get there are two ways. A either it their own, for example, somebody were uh, hunters in their families or some relative just donate them money for a weapon to buy it, or they capture it from separatist side. That's why. So and uh, our government they doesn't support they they, do, uh, they don't support right sector at all because it's some political reason because right sector is a both political party and uh, like military uh, paramilitary organization and probably Ukrainian government they are scared a bit uh, right sector to to to, to achieve their may uh, to, to uh, when they will get a weapon they they would try to achieve like maybe some political goals that's why so this is my theory and. Uh, I would like also just I have five five minutes is enough. Uh, you you can f ask me question then, and um, 
I, I, I would like to, to, to also mention a few reasons of this war. I, I mean, there are a lot of myths in uh, Russian media which, uh, which are spread, which could be spread by Russia today and another TV channels. Um, uh, the main uh, problem of these conflicts, and this is also true, I want, I, I want to be frank with you, but when I was in Eastern Ukraine, for example, near Donetsk and Lugansk regions, <coughs> I think to my to my to my data, around uh, maybe 40, 45 percent of people are strongly against Ukraine Ukrainian army. 40, 45 percent, because uh, uh, when Russians they come to some village or some small city, all they do the first thing is to cut off Ukrainian channels and establish their own. So, for example, you can imagine yourself living in some village and somebody st started to shelling or something like this, and then you watch TV channel and where, where Russian reporters, they say that it was committed by Ukrainian army. So, r the Russian propaganda is so strong that I don't even talk to my close relatives in eastern Ukraine because they say that I'm now Nazi and Junta or something like this. <laughs> this is true. And the prehistory, just uh, six points of the prehistory of this war. war. So the, the first is the Soviet uh, heritage of the East, uh, people of Eastern Ukraine. So I can call them pro-Russian, they're more pro-Soviet, because like a lot of them miners, like hard workers, they had uh, all these guarantees, all this social stability during Soviet times. And this, uh, this, these people, they are more pro-Soviet. They expect if they will establish their own state or like people's like so-called Donetsk and Luhansk Republic, they could just achieve the goals which they, they, had, they could gain what they had during Soviet times. The second is uh, austerity and a poor uh, population in Eastern Ukraine. So the average price in Eastern Ukraine, the average salary in Eastern Ukraine, it could be around a thousand dollars a year. So you can see people are very poor and people are, could be simply manipulated. The third, is, which I mentioned before, is uh, Russian propaganda. This is too strong and I just like uh, mentioned this example with my relative. This is really strong and, and if you could, uh, if you, in, in, they're even scary to come in Kyiv because they, they are sure that the Kyiv is occupied by Nazi and they shot everybody who is Russian speaker. That's why. So the propaganda is really strong. The first is a mental division uh, of um, Ukraine. So all this year, politicians try to speculate on this like uh, uh, Ukrainian like re regional <coughs> issue, either on history. I mean, Ukraine is really complicated state. They try to speculate it either on history, either on language, either some like maybe some uh, very like um, very. Um, how to say, uh, controversial topics, you know. But for sure, everybody understands that there is no problems in Ukraine with the language, with the history, and so on. But politicians, even Ukrainian politicians, all they try to do is divide Ukrainians on that issue. So the, the conflict has been blowing for like Sunday independence, probably. And even if you will see the results of votings in Ukraine, either parliamentary or local or like presidential, you will see that Ukraine is divided even politically, you know. So, and politicians did everything to just blow the conflict. And now that we have the result. The fifth is a weak reaction of uh, Ukrainian government because it was it wasn't probably exist at all in March when the first uh, uh, local administrations were occupied by pro-Russian like or local separatists in small villages. So uh, if we would have like more strong reaction uh, just just to imprison all these people or send our militaries or send our special forces to uh, just to, 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 to take them uh, or just to shut them off, uh, we, we could be more, we, we could, could prevent this conflict. And the third, uh, the sixth is, it's last but not the least, the Crimean example. So people in Eastern Ukraine, they also have, well, I, as I said to you, it was like pro-Russian, nostal pro-Soviet nostalgia, and they expected Crimean scenario in Eastern Ukraine. So in the uh, beginning of the conflict, nobody expected that Ukrainian army will, like, will fight 
uh, against like these separatists. They expected just to do it peacefully like it was in Crimea, that Putin will invade immediately and just to cut their state and will um, will 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 unite it with like whole Russia. That's why. So people expected for Crimea scenario scenario, but it it, it wouldn't it, it it didn't happen. So. This is all like my like brief speech. It's really okay. it was really okay. brief, but we can continue. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Hal. Um, I, I I really want to extend before we get started uh, my thanks uh, to to the Heritage Foundation and to Hella Dale and of course uh, Luke Coffey here for the chance to talk about this. As we've seen from the previous presentation, uh, we are at a very pivotal moment uh, in the transatlantic security. Um, uh, relationship. Uh, that, that pivot point at this present time revolves around Ukraine. And so the question for the panel here today, uh, I love the title, uh, The Battle for Ukraine, because I, I think it really frames the stakes that we face. And the question is, what, what should we do about it? Uh, what I thought I would do uh, for my contribution is to approach it from a, a regional perspective. Uh, as many of you uh, may know, um, the Center for European Policy Analysis, CEPA, is the only think tank uh, in Washington uh, that is focused exclusively on the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so we're talking about both America's uh, NATO allies inside uh, the European Union, as well as the uh, countries on the immediate frontier of Europe, uh, many of whom consider themselves European, and rightfully so, uh, but the frontiers of, of the NATO alliance, uh, Belarus, Moldova, Ukraine. Uh, when I was Putting my thoughts together, uh, I, it seemed to me that, that what we're facing is, is ultimately a, a three-part problem. Uh, the first is that uh, big power realpolitik is very real, uh, NATO is very sick, and failure is certainly an option if we get our, our policy response wrong. Uh, so for some insight into what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong, I, I actually was really intrigued by an interview uh, that Henry Kissinger gave recently to uh, Der Spiegel, the German newspaper. If you have not yet read the interview, it makes for some very grim reading. In it, Kissinger asserts uh, three things that I think are correct. Uh, the first is that there are no universally accepted international rules. Uh, there's no, uh, no one governing the international system right now under a set of rules that anyone accepts. The Chinese have their options. The Russians are presenting their own. Uh, in the West, we have, we have ours uh, based on the institutions of, say, the OSCE or the United Nations. Uh, second, Kissinger asserts that there is no strategy in place right now to restore Crimea. And thirdly, he says that Ukraine should not hope to become a member of NATO anytime in the foreseeable future due to the veto that um, existing members of the alliance can, can uh, invoke over the expansion of NATO. On all three points here, I think Kissinger is right. But Kissinger, that wasn't all he said. Uh, he kept talking. And as he kept talking, he, I think he got a lot of things wrong. What he got wrong, I believe, represents the passkey uh, for how we can uh, bring about a positive end result for Ukraine. So what did Kissinger get wrong? Well, first, he asserts that America and Europe did not understand the impact of Ukraine's association agreement or the Maidan revolution. This is not true. Uh, the Maidan was not a failure of Europe's Eastern policy uh, or the Eastern agenda. It was a validation of it. In many respects, it's been said before, and I think it's true, that the Ukrainians ultimately believed in us far more than we believe in ourselves. I think that needs to change. Second, Kissinger asserts that uh, it was the West's failure to understand Russia's special relationship uh, with Ukraine. Uh, and that failure to understand that relationship, Kissinger says, was fatal. This is dead wrong. We understood that relationship perfectly clear because we had that relationship in writing. Uh, the relationship between Russia and Ukraine was based on a number of established treaties and international agreements and not some insignificant documents either. We're talking about the United Nations Charter, the Helsinki Final Act, the Budapest Memorandum, the NATO-Russia Founding Act, and of course the Russo-Ukrainian Treaty of Friendship of 1997. This was the basis for the international settlement, the 1989 settlement of the East in Europe. And uh, this is what Russia fractured 
when it uh, illegally annexed Crimea and then instituted a, a limited war against <coughs> the uh, sovereign Ukrainian state. This therefore creates a dividing line in Europe and, and in our own strategic horizon. Uh, that line exists over the time before Crimea and the time after. We are now in a new security environment, uh, one where Russia is acting as a very potent revisionist power. Secondly, Russia is winning this struggle. And third, I, I believe this is the important part here, I believe Russia can be stopped. Uh, and it is in how Russia can be stopped that we see uh, something, uh, the final point that Kissinger got wrong. Kissinger asserts that nobody is willing to fight over eastern Ukraine. He, he asserts this is a, a weakness for us. Uh, this is true to an extent. Uh, the United States does not want a war over Ukraine. Russia does not want a war with NATO over Ukraine. However, it is in that fight for Ukraine uh, that I believe it needs to be more about uh, restoring, de restoring deterrence uh, to predatory states such as Russia. Uh, Russia is testing our deterrent structures, and right now we are failing that test. Uh, I believe if we uh, th take a step back, assess what our current strategy is, we can begin to, to see um, how we can adjust. Uh, so, what does all of this mean? Well, it means that if we allow Russia to succeed, uh, Russia will rewrite the rules of Europe. In Georgia and Ukraine, Russia wants us to accept that uh, th the international system should be based on armies and nuclear weapons. These should be the things that make the rules, not laws and treaties, respect for human dignity, and the right of countries to determine their own destinations, east or west. Failure for us will have some very high costs. It means that America's Central and Eastern European allies will ultimately ingest instability in the East rather than radiate stability outwards. This is something that the United States has come to rely upon our, our allies in Central Europe for quite some time. We want that to continue. We do not want it to be reversed. Uh, failure for us means that countries uh, will ultimately seek to rely more on themselves uh, for protection. Uh, rather, uh, the countries inside NATO being a great example, they will rely on themselves for protection rather than the established mechanisms of collective security. And finally, a failure means that the old ethnic and national frictions of, from the past will begin to guide policy, not the values and the ideals of that 1989 moment, an event which occurred 25 years ago and is increasingly having less relevance in the strategic calculations of, of states today. So all of this is very heady stuff. So what, what should we do about it? What, what do actual recommendations look like in the battle for Ukraine? Well, from a policy perspective, I think we can break it out into what the Ukrainians should be doing, what the United States can do, and what we can do from an Atlanticist perspective, what we can do from, uh, from the perspective of NATO and, and the European Union. For Ukrainians, first and foremost, I think it is imperative that the United States provide Ukrainians with the ability to defend themselves. This is a sovereign state recognized by the United States. Their territory is under threat, and we, as the United States, should be giving them the defensive, lethal arms to protect their own territory. Uh, if we can arm the Kurds uh, from a U.S. perspective, we can provide military equipment to the Ukrainians. But not just equipment. It's, it's one thing to have, have a, a piece of equipment. It's another thing to know how to use it. Uh, and so I think that uh, we've done some very good job, uh, very good work in, in uh, training uh, Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, and that needs to continue. It needs to be bolstered. And it needs to be vectored along the lines of lethal military assistance. Uh, for the United States, we need a new strategy, one that seeks to assure our allies, uh, deter future incursions against NATO, and ultimately defend uh, NATO's eastern flank in the event that it, it experiences um, security pressures introduced by Russia's new methods of hybrid warfare. Uh, essentially, these are, this is what we're seeing in eastern Ukraine. This is a level of conflict which exists just below the threshold of, of, um, of danger, uh, which NATO was created to, to, uh, to deter. Uh, NATO is ideally calibrated to protect Europe against a World War III style, large state on state conflict. NATO is very poorly situated to deter uh, the kind of hybrid warfare, limited warfare techniques we're seeing in, in eastern Ukraine. That needs to change. Russia has raised the stakes in the European security environment, and now it is time for the final point for the United States to raise the costs. This means to continue to impose severe 
uh, crippling sanctions on Russia, it must be seen in an undeniable sense that great power predation has costs. Uh, those costs can take the form of uh, it, the existing regime of sanctions, uh, or they can be bolstered and recalibrated to target specific weak points in the Russian economy. These sanctions should not exist for their own sake. We shouldn't say, well, we've done sanctions. They should exist to show very clearly to Russia and everyone else in the world that just because you have armies does not mean that you can unsettle the international system. Finally, for NATO, I think it's important that we prepare for the current methods of warfare that we're seeing. Right now, when you look at NATO, NATO is ideally situated uh, to defend against World War III circa 1983. If you look at our force posture, at many of uh, NATO's capabilities, uh, they're largely uh, concentrated in the West and largely concentrated against large scale, uh, concentrated to defend against large scale, con st scale conflicts. This needs to change. Uh, this means that we need to look beyond our current reliance on tripwires. This is the idea that if we have a few soldiers in, say, a Baltic country or, or along the eastern frontier, Russia won't attack because they'll risk killing a few uh, NATO soldiers. I think uh, the time has come to move beyond the old concepts of temporary basing and move into a new era where NATO has established permanent and significant force uh, base. Uh, forces based in Central and Eastern Europe. This means the Baltic states, this means Poland, it could ideally mean Romania as well. Uh, we also need to be training for the right kinds of battles. Uh, NATO needs to train to respond to hybrid warfare techniques as we've seen in Ukraine. Uh, I think from when you, when you look at what NATO's capabilities are and how we're training to defend against 21st century threats, uh, we could be doing a lot more. Right now, we are not training for failure. We're not testing our forces to the extent that is necessary to find out what's wrong, uh, where, we see, where we can succeed and fail. Um, a lot of these training exercises are calibrated to guarantee success. I'm not sure when you test yourself to, to know if you're ready for game day, uh, if it's the best strategy to always assume that your opponent is not going to be very capable or ingenious. And, and, that, and that's, a, that's a weakness that we can address. Ultimately, when it comes to Ukraine, the United States is in a very unique position to lead. Uh, that's a position that we uh, have neglected uh, over the last uh, 12 months uh, to some extent. Uh, the United States has done many good things, uh, whether or not it's extending uh, rhetorical or political support to the Ukrainians, providing uh, financial assistance uh, <coughs> in tandem with the World Bank and the European Union. But I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. At the end of the day, if we do not demonstrate through our policies and through our strategy, uh, that great power predation, that efforts to undermine the 1989 settlement of Europe uh, do not incur significant and obvious costs to the aggressor state, we will set a very alarming and dangerous precedent. It will encourage future probing, not just against Ukraine, uh, but against uh, the Atlantic Alliance as a whole. This is something which we can avoid if we act now. Uh, if we do not, uh, we, we, risk, um, we was, risk great failure in the future. This is not something that uh, the United States, the Ukrainians, or uh, frankly the European Union wants to see and it can be avoided. Uh, so here's uh, three, uh, three sort of vectors on how we can adjust our strategy. Um, I'd look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you. Thanks okay. very much. Over to Luke. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Hella, for um, taking the initiative to organize this event. And I want to thank everyone. Um, Echo, Hella's thanks for everyone coming to the Heritage Foundation, the, the first working day after such a long, long holiday. Um, it's hard to believe that it's, it's already been just slightly over a year when, uh, when uh, Ukraine, of course, was approaching its end of November 2013 deadline to make the final reforms and pass the final bits of legislation to qualify itself to sign the association agreement with the EU. Um, and think how much has happened in the past year. Yanukovych is out. There's a, what seems to be a pro-Western government in Kiev. Um, Crimea has been illegally annexed. And the eastern oblasts of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk are in rebellion. Um, there's a fragile ceasefire that remains in place, but there's still localized fighting. So even though it's, um, it's been a very eventful year, um, I suspect next year will, could be even more eventful and it will be a very challenging <clears throat> and pivotal year. I want to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 
I want to first uh, discuss sort of the situation on the ground and some of the recent ev events that have led us to where we are today, and then talk a bit about the political situation. And then I would like to just um, dabble a bit on uh, kind of not predicting, because that's a very bad word to use in this field, but lay out some courses of action that, that Russia um, might take in eastern and, and southern Ukraine. And then I want to talk specifically about what the U.S. can do to help the Ukrainians. I think that when MH17 was shot down in July, it, it was a decision point for Vladimir Putin. Um, I think it was Nikol Nikolai who said that uh, Moscow and also the separatists in Luhansk and Donetsk didn't really think the Ukrainian military, that Kiev would put up a fight um, in the east of the country. They thought perhaps that the Ukrainian military was going to roll over like it did um, over Crimea. And I think they were caught off guard when uh, Kiev mounted <clears throat> an attempt to, to uh, quell the rebellion, but also to retake some of this territory. And I think that when um, the, the shooting down of MH17 occurred, Vladimir Putin had a, a, an option of an off-ramp uh, from the crisis. And I think at that point he might have wanted to have an off-ramp, actually. I think he, too, thought perhaps the situation was spiraling a little bit out of his control. I think sometimes we give him too much credit for how much control he has on events in the east of Ukraine. Without a doubt, he has his hand pulling many of the strings, but I think we do give him too much credit. And I think he, uh, he realized that he could say, this is a tragic accident, this has gone off control, um, we're going to ramp down and try to get a ceasefire in a political settlement, or he could double down and try to get more control of the situation. Um, and that's what he did. And of course, NATO estimates uh, place the number of Russian troops at 4,000 operating at the, at the peak in eastern Ukraine. We've seen, uh, and one of the brilliant things about social media is that you just see it, you know, <laughs> with your own eyes, what, uh, the, the Russian armor, the Russian tanks, the Russian anti-aircraft weapons, um, Russian built and Russian supplied. Uh, you can see it with your own eyes. Um, and uh, Putin realized that um, he was going to, uh, like I said, double down and try to, uh, to, uh, stop the Ukrainian offensive. And he was largely successful in stopping the Ukrainian offensive. Um, <clears throat> the, of course, the Ukrainian military and some of the volunteer battalions were making some decent progress and were able to bring some of the, uh, the territory that was controlled by the separatists back under the control of the central government. And uh, but I think that Moscow realized that if they were really going to roll the Ukrainian military back, it would require an even bigger commitment of uh, Russian resources, and I don't think he was willing, Putin was willing to go that far at that time. So that's why we saw the September uh, ceasefire agreement, which of course was done um, in a very Russian way, taking advantage of um, social media, the news cycle, and propaganda. It just so happened that the same weekend of the NATO summit in Wales was the weekend that finally all sides came to an agreement. Um, which stole the news cycle away from from the NATO summit. In fact, uh, you, we ha I saw this. We had this curious situation where uh, Rasmussen was giving his farewell uh, speech as Secretary General live on television, and then all of a sudden it was breaking news: um, Ukraine ceasefire agreement. And then you it cuts to Poroshenko at like the. 18th hole of this golf course doing an impromptu press conference and it completely diverted the attention the news cycle away from from the NATO summit um, and focused it on what Moscow wanted it to be focused on this was this great achievement of, of this uh, supposed ceasefire um, then we so we still have the localized fighting today which um, uh, the, while the ceasefire remains in place uh, there without a doubt if you're uh, if you're stationed at uh, Donetsk airport, you don't think there's a ceasefire at all. But largely speaking, across the east of the country, um, it hasn't broken out back into full-blown um, warfare. Uh, the recent political developments in Ukraine have been positive. Of course, with the recent elections, we, depending on how you count, 
up to 90% um, of people that were able to vote, of course, because remember the people in Crimea and then the occupied uh, separatist regions in, in uh, eastern Ukraine were, were unable to cast their vote in the national elections. But for those that did a vote, over 90% voted for political parties that, had a, that have a Western view, right? But one thing that the elections did teach us, and while they were successful in that the Ukrainian people, largely speaking, want to look West, they also showed how divided the country really is. Although the opposition bloc um, party uh, received just right at 10% of the vote, a little under 10% of the vote, it was heavily concentrated in the East, in, in, in the Donbass region, and in, in Luhansk, Donetsk, and Kharkiv Oblast. And you can't deny that the country is, uh, isn't divided, is clearly divided politically, which... Um, creates a, a challenge for the government in Kiev because essentially they're, the central government is fighting against a rebellion, against a counterinsurgency, fighting a counterinsurgency operation that's backed by an outside power, in this case Russia. And of course the, uh, the goal for any counterinsurgency is to give the insurgent an opportunity to express his political grievances through a political process and not through violence. Um, and we saw through the political process how divided the country actually is. Um, so what's Russia's next move? I think that uh, the ultimate goal is to keep Ukraine out of the transatlantic community, whether that's in NATO or whether that's in the European Union. This is the ultimate goal of Russia. So to achieve this, I think they have some short-term and possibly some long-term goals. I think for the short-term goals, uh, Russia will want to keep this conflict frozen. Um, and the status quo right now benefits Russia. Right, a frozen conflict is almost a Russian victory because it means the government in Kiev does not have control over its all of its territory. Um, then Russia can exert its influence in in the re rebel-controlled areas in in Ukraine against Kiev as bargaining chips. Um, we see this in um, in other places uh, around um, Russia's periphery where there are frozen conflicts, whether it's Nagorno Karabakh or even with Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Georgia. We see this play out. And like one scenario could be as the deadline approaches to finally um, sign the agreement to get closer with the European Union, uh, Vladimir Putin could say, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you guys just say no to Europe forever, we will work out a deal to get these occupied territories back inside Ukraine under the control of Kiev in some sort of federalized system. And, uh, you know, that might be very tempting for a Ukrainian politician if the territorial integrity of his country is, is important. Um, they'll want to ensure that the conflict continues through this winter, of course, because then they can use fuel as a weapon. And they'll continue to use propaganda, which Nikolai talked about in great detail, especially in the western part of, the Ukra uh, western part of Ukraine, in order to paint the current government as corrupt and competent and, uh, and complacent and, and weak. And, you know, their corruption is a big problem in Ukraine, so Russian propaganda efforts won't be too difficult in, in that regard. Some of the longer term goals and, and more ambitious goals on Russia could be, and I want to caveat these, they, that these are, if just the right circumstances are in place for Russia to act. Um, some of these could be creating a land bridge uh, to, um, to Crimea. Uh, and this would, of course, require capturing Mariupol, which is uh, Ukraine's 10th uh, largest city. Um, which that would be no um, easy undertaking. Um, and they might want to push even further to create a land bridge to Transnistria um, in eastern Moldova. And this would, of course, require capturing Odessa, Ukraine's third largest city. So I think right now these are off the table, but it could be part of a long-term process because they do need that land bridge to Crimea because right now it's becoming increasingly expensive to uh, maintain uh, the Russian presence in Crimea and provide all the public services to the Crimean people. Um, I think that uh, what the U.S. can do for Ukraine, I think that sometimes in Washington we have a very black and white view of the world. Um, it's, it's, it's not either withdraw or uh, uh, intervene. It's not um, engagement or isolation. The alternative to grand U.S. military intervention in a country doesn't have to be to do nothing at all. Okay, so there are things... Um, in the middle that we can and should do. I think we need to continue on with the economic sanctions. I think they are having a, a slowly having an impact, and if they're kept in, um, enduringly, they will continue to have an impact. I think that um, oil prices are helping us. Uh, but I think this is a coincidence uh, that Saudi Arabia has decided at this time to take on U.S. frackers. 
um, because while the price of oil, West Texas Instrument trading at $66 a barrel today, Brent crude trading at $70 a barrel, while this helps us against Russia, um, Saudi Arabia knows that if uh, the barrel of, of a barrel of oil trades consistently in the low 60s, um, it'll cause problems for U.S. fracking, and it'll, fracking won't be profitable at that level. Um, but right now, it's, so it's a double-edged sword. I think we need to develop a new diplomatic strategy against Russia. Uh, we need to acknowledge that the Russian reset is dead. You still have government officials going on TV saying that, well, it wasn't a bad policy we tried. It was a bad policy from the beginning, and it's dead, and we should move on from it. Um, and we should continue to isolate Russia anywhere we can diplomatically. Um, we need to adopt a new global free trade energy policy. We need to be able to export uh, refined um, crude oil and export LNG to our allies in Europe. The obvious benefits, there are obvious benefits to this. Uh, it creates a situation where many of our allies are not dependent on Russia to keep the lights on and keep the houses warm. And finally, echoing um, um, Peter's comments, I do think it's time that we have a serious conversation about arming the Ukrainians with defensive weapons. Every country has the inherent right to self-defense. If these weapons are defensive in nature and if the Ukrainians are taught on how to use these weapons properly, I think that it's a le there's a legitimate justification to provide these weapons. Um, I think that uh, I was hesitant at first um, in the spring about this because the situation was so fluid, right? But we now have a relatively stabilized situation in the East thanks to the ceasefire. Um, we have um, ongoing training missions to Ukraine, uh, either bilaterally or multilaterally through NATO. And finally, the recent elections did show that the country is looking to the West. I think now this is the time to you know, consider providing these defensive anti-tank and anti-aircraft weapons. And we can also um, help with their wounded soldiers. Um, it was pointed out that more you, uh, the official figure is over 1,000. Um, Nikolai thinks the number is considerably higher. But even if it's just 1,000, more Ukrainian soldiers have died fighting in Ukraine than all the European soldiers have died fighting in Afghanistan since 2001. So the yeah. human cost has been great. And they have, you know, hundreds of wounded soldiers, and we have a lot of experience taking care of wounded soldiers from our experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan. We should help provide some of this expertise to the Ukrainians. So to sum up, the difference between Russia and the U.S. right now is that Russia has a strategy that it's willing to follow, and the U.S. is sort of hoping that this problem disappears. Um, Russia has been able to exploit this situation on the ground, knowing that the West will not respond in any serious way. Um, and it's time to acknowledge that Russia's imperial ambitions, really, they have no limits. And we must develop our strategy accordingly. So we need to get rid of the reactionary, and we need to get some real strategy in place. Thank you. Thank you very much to our panel. <laughs> we have about 15 minutes. Um, and uh, if we have some questions here, we would be delighted to take them from the audience. Uh, I would like to ask you to identify yourself by name <coughs> and affiliation so we can capture this for our website uh, where this program is running and will be um, viewable in the future. So uh, we've got two microphones. Um, let's see, what this over here first on, on the side. My name is Clemens Husch from the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, um, actually based from Germany. Um, a question to you, Luke. Um, you said you want, uh, you you expect a new um, diplomatic way from from the U.S. And you said um, in the same sentence uh, you want to isolate uh, Russia. Um, that sounds to me uh, like paradox. Could you uh, explain your your idea a bit bit uh, deeper? Uh, what do you mean with uh, those both a aspects? Well, we, should I take an hour? We're going to take a few. Um, oh, I can quickly answer it. Yeah, uh, perhaps you misunderstood me. What, what I mean by a new diplomatic strategy on how we deal with Russia, how do we mobilize our friends and allies to be all on the same sheet of music, whether it's economic sanctions um, or whatever, to deal with Russia? And then separately, we need to continue to isolate Russia to show that this behavior is not how a member of the the um, the G8 the G20 uh, acts or the G8 or any of these other international forums we were right to suspend NATO Russia cooperation um, and we should start treating Russia um, like we would any country that doesn't play by the 
international norms that we all accept. Okay, I think uh, well, we've got a lot of questions, so why don't we take three of them and then have our panel comment. Uh, right next to them, then we'll move that way. Hi, I'm... My name is Ed Verona. I'm with McLarty Associates. Um, when President Poroshenko addressed Congress, uh, I received a strong show of support uh, from both houses. Uh, and I'm and immediately afterward, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee adopted the uh, um, uh, Ukraine Freedom Support Act uh, unanimously. That is now pending. I understand as a companion bill in the House side. What do you believe are the prospects for that bill? Would it be ta will it be taken up in the lame duck session? Uh, if it isn't, what will happen when uh, the new Congress uh, is instated? Thank you. Okay, let's. There's a question up there in the back. Uh, Henry Hetker, researcher, now retired federal government. Uh, over 50 years ago, we were faced with the most serious crisis internationally that our nation has ever been faced with, and that was the Cuban Missile Crisis. President Kennedy was able to work out an agreement that solved this crisis. And I wondered, we hear daily of reasons to ramp up sanctions. And then, of course, increasing military and other assistance to the Ukraine. And I wondered, is there anything possibly on the horizon, uh, although it could be classified, and if it is, it wouldn't be discussed, that that might be a way to solve this crisis once and for all. It keeps increasing in scope with the loss of the airliner, uh, increasing casualties day by day, and, of course, increasing uh, recession, which they say Russia is on the brink of it, uh, as well as uh, the ruble falling to 53 today. And in the West, uh, a similar situation exists, perhaps not quite as serious, but it depends on where you're located. So I wondered, is there some way to solve the crisis that hasn't been somehow been investigated? Okay, and let's take the question over here along the side on the left. Evan, ben Evan Banner, Staff, Monterey Institute. Uh, the accepted notion is that the sanctions regime, regime cumulatively such that uh, the average lives of Russians will be affected and that will um, potentially push Putin out of power. Um, my question is, with the propaganda he has set in place that the, Rush, uh, the West is trying to bring, us, bring Russia to its knees, what are the chances that those sanctions actually have the reverse effects and consolidate uh, Russian approval behind the president rather than affecting his approval ratings. Okay, so we've got some questions about Washington policy, about the effect on Russia. Um, do we have any bids here for answers to some of the questions posed? I'd like to yes. sort of yes. try, uh, Luke, if you want as sure. well. Um, on, uh, if I could just sort of dovetail with uh, what Luke said on isolating Russia. Um, ultimately, the the very clear problem we face inside the Atlantic community is a, is a difference of opinion as to the th kind of threat that Russia poses. Uh, the view in Europe, uh, as represented by the recent decision not to impose uh, a new layer of, of more um, robust sanctions on Russia, is indicative of these cleavages. Russia understands this, these cleavages very well and looks to exploit them. We need to close that gap. Uh, this means uh, having a very clear conversation with, within the European community uh, about the kind of threat Russia uh, poses uh, to, to, the, uh, to, to Ukraine and to Europe. Ultimately, it comes down to an issue of precedent. If Russia is allowed to establish the precedent that uh, countries with nuclear weapons and armies at their disposal can rewrite borders at will, we uh, face a very dangerous and um, unsettled 21st century, not just in Europe, but also uh, think of the ramifications for Iran, uh, think of the ramifications for um, the uh, for East Asia. Uh, we are uh, at a pivotal moment because the, the message we sent through our policies and strategies and actions uh, will resonate for years into the future as to what is acceptable and unacceptable in the international system. And right now, uh, people might not like it, they, they might give speeches against it, but the reality on the ground in Crimea and eastern Ukraine is that the international system is incapable of enforcing uh, the sovereignty of borders, the uh, self-determination of countries, etc. Uh, that must end. 
And uh, so on the question of sanctions that was raised, uh, it, could sanctions have a blowback effect on us? Could, could they actually uh, uh, force uh, or encourage Russians to uh, band together against, you know, us against them? Uh, ultimately, um, I, don't, I don't buy this narrative. Uh, I don't believe it's true. Uh, I believe that we have the means at our disposal to shut down an oil state. We've already seen how it can be done. Uh, the Iran Sanctions Act provides us a very clear template for the kinds of tools at our disposal, non-lethal, non-military tools, economic tools, uh, which can be utilized uh, to uh, prevent an oil state from making money. Russia is an oil state. Uh, Russia is very exposed to these kinds of vulnerabilities. Uh, and uh, with uh, Saudi swing production and with the uh, North Dakota and America, the North Dakota oil boom, the rebirth of the American oil industry, uh, I believe that we could mitigate uh, any um, long and mid-term and near-term uh, consequences of, of really uh, applying uh, aspects of the Iran Sanctions Act to Russia. Politically, that is very difficult. Uh, however, it is uh, less difficult, uh, or I believe it will be less difficult under the new Congress than the previous Congress. And that gets us to the, I, I guess, the question that, uh, on, on legislation. It's probably easier to predict the outcome of security conflicts in eastern Ukraine than it is the ebb and flow of legislation in Congress. What I do know is mm -hmm. that right now there are a lot of really smart folks in, on the Hill who are asking one organizing question. How does the United States calibrate our foreign policy and legislative response to this pressure? Uh, and as I think we've got some good ideas here on the table. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the biggest one would be um, uh, bolstered sanctions, uh, lethal assistance. Uh, lethal assistance to the Ukrainian uh, army, and uh, deterrence, um, new methods of deterring future probing against revisionist predatory states. Good. I think uh, Nick has a Yeah, yeah has just remarks from U to... Ukrainian perspective, mm -hmm. I want just to, uh, well, there is interior policy, I understand, here in the United States, but like talking to the guys in the front line, the image of the West is declining every day because of this like toothless policy because everybody understands right now so uh, especially people on the ground they understand that nobody will help us except ourselves you know all the army feel from the west right now will be may, maybe there is some trainers i didn't see them but i've heard about they provide some like trainings for ukrainian army and all it was it was like meals ready for it <laughs> but it has already expired you know <laughs> That's all. So they never expire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, that's why. And people just like in private conversation, like a lot of uh, uh, appeal to Budapest Memorandum, and it was a wrong idea to abandon our nuclear weapon. Everybody, like a lot of people, says. And I'll just answer mm -hmm. the the second question about um, why can't we come to some sort of agreement and negotiate a, a deal like the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think the stakes were so high in this. I think the two situations are so different that there, it's difficult to compare. And the stakes were so high during the Cuban Missile Crisis um, that it, because of something that doesn't exist today over Ukraine, mutually assured destruction, um, it incentivized both sides to come to some sort of agreement. And I don't think that we're going to see the situation in eastern Ukraine elevated to, to the, the level of importance by the Kremlin or the White House, as we saw with the Cuban Missile Crisis. So. Okay, let's have a quick second round of questions, and then we'll wrap up. Um, yes, down here in the front. Thank you. I'm Dr. Dishar Chaudhry with the Pakistan American League. As you said, that there's a, a big difference between the Cuban crisis and the present crisis in Ukraine. In the same way, there's a big difference between the Iranian problem and the Ukrainian problem, because uh, Russia is uh, loaded with nuclear weapons and uh, nuclear warheads at the same time. And it should not be pushed to a point that the conflict escalates. Instead, one should come up with creative ideas to resolve this issue. They also have their own ultra-nationalism, nationalism. Their army is very nationalistic, and Putin is very nationalistic. So it's important that a way should be found out to resolve this issue. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, my question is that uh, how can uh, you really succeed in isolating a, a country which has uh, very close relations with China and with many other countries in South America? Iran had relationship with no country. Uh, Russia is not that alone as we think. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's 
see, we have a question over here on that side. Thank you very much. Is this working? Okay. Thank you very much for, for your comments. Um, my name is Sue Taylor, and I'm with the National Office of the Church of Scientology. And we have a lot of churches and a lot of members in the Ukraine, so that's our, our concern. Uh, but uh, my question is, there's a lot of black propaganda coming, as you mentioned, from the Russian side. Uh, what is being done or what can be done, either from the United States or from Ukraine, by individual members or whatever, to counter that black propaganda and fill the vacuum with the true data of what, what is going on and the, the true data from the Ukrainian perspective. Okay, and we'll take one question from the middle here. I'm a former Georgian ambassador to NATO. Just a very brief uh, comment. I think that uh, there were a couple of questions uh, how to accommodate or how to reach an uh, agreement with Russia. I think that what we have learned so far is that if Russia doesn't pay any political price, uh, it will never stop uh, in Ukraine as well. So it was, uh, if we all remember, it all started in the 90s. Uh, Russia has never paid any political price. In 2008, Georgia was occupied. Uh, I was in Brussels at that time, and in just a few weeks, NATO went back into business as usual, and there was this uh, notorious uh, reset uh, policy, and we got uh, to the point of Crimea. Uh, there was no response to Crimea as well, and uh, uh, till the uh, Malaysian uh, airline was uh, shut down, uh, there was no uh, meaningful uh, discussion or deliberation of uh, sanctions. So, and then came the Eastern Ukraine. So I think that uh, only thing that, and I think that I thank uh, to uh, both to the, uh, all uh, panelists, uh, they have mentioned very concrete steps that have to be taken. Uh, one, I think that when Poroshenko and president comes here, he should not return back empty-handed. And there should be a meaningful uh, defense uh, assistance coming from the United States. Because uh, otherwise, Russian uh, message is very clear. While the West is uh, talking, we are acting. On the other hand, we should not have uh, here any kind of deliberations, whether this is incursion or invasion, because it, and I, I, I hold agree with Nicola, that it irritates people on the ground. When our main partners, uh, when we see the whole uh, Russian armor entering the uh, European uh, state, and what we are doing, or what the United States is doing, discussing whether this is incursion or invasion, and going into semantics, it sends a wrong signal uh, as well. Sorry for this comment, no question. I think that if Russia doesn't pay any political price at this stage, and this is a regime, finally, uh, that does not intend to live in Russia themselves. Their families are living in the uh, United States or in Europe. Uh, uh, they themselves have their wealth in the United States or in Europe. And United States and Europeans have sufficient uh, mechanisms and sufficient leverages to put more meaningful uh, sanctions that are in place today. If Europeans don't come along, there are, as in case of Gazprom, I think that the United States can go forward and set an example in some cases. And the uh, United States doesn't need to consolidate the whole uh, European uh, uh, agreement at the same time. Uh, if we come to this point, then believe me, Russia will be accommodative. Because Russia, for Russian perspective, threat doesn't come from the West. If Russia is not accommodating, then at the end of the day, Russia will uh, end up uh, as, a, uh, as a satellite of uh, China. And there are many smart people in Russia, and they know that. And they will be accommodating at the end of the day if they know th that their irresponsible actions uh, uh, are somehow uh, open, opening a way to, uh, for a significant political crisis. Thank you. OK. Um, panelists. Uh Last remarks here. Uh, it was a really nice question about, thanks for your remarks and for your questions about this, how to block propaganda, Russian propaganda. So uh, it, it's really debatable, you know, because on the one hand, we have a freedom of speech in Ukraine, like it should be like it's independent, independent media. But on the other hand, we have, it's not like, in me well, well, because like, to my mind, it should correspond, and every media should correspond to some like standards but like Russian media, they don't. I mean, the, 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 in our case, in our emergency case, all we need is just to cut off Russian channels. So that, that, that's the answer to how to block their propaganda. Just to cut off their channels. That's all. 
Well, so you're, uh, ну, you're, если вы говорите на русском, вы можете посмотреть you русские you're, you're каналы. You're welcome, you're welcome to Sorry. Maybe the discussion uh, offline. That's that's okay. I un I understand. We we just we're we're moving forward with the program, and afterwards you can certainly ask Nick a question that you that is on your mind. I know he would be delighted to answer any. <laughs> Even for coffee, why not? <laughs> uh, we'll have some sandwiches yeah. outside. I expect everybody would cool. like to have a little lunch. Um, I, I'll, I'll just take a, just the final thought on, a, on the question about a, accommodating Russia and a uh, question about sanctions and, and, and how, how do you uh, in, uh, approach a country that is so interconnected. Uh, when it comes to accommodating Russia, uh, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, there are some very clear things that Russia needs to do uh, before we can have that kind of converse, conversation. Uh, the first is to uh, cease its uh, support of proxy forces uh, in eastern Ukraine, and secondly, and most importantly, uh, to withdraw from Crimea. This is uh, illegally occupied, stolen territory, and the basis of um, uh, the status quo arrangement of Europe, uh, we, we can't have a conversation about uh, the status quo of Europe until we, we restore the status quo. Uh, when it comes to a sanctions, it's, it's, it's truly tr difficult. Uh, right now, Russia is the largest economy that uh, the international system has ever tried to impose sanctions on. Uh, Russia is a very integrated economy. Uh, we are learning as we go uh, how when you apply sanctions in one point, you, you create uh, complexities elsewhere. Uh, that said, uh, the importance of sanctions is not just to have them in place. It is to calibrate a very specific outcome. Uh, in this case, uh, we are raising the economic and strategic costs to Russia's integration into the global economy for its uh, violation of the international uh, norms. You cannot benefit from the, uh, the goods that come from the international system, free trade, affluence, financial wealth, while, while simultaneously undermining that same system. In this case, uh, uh, crossing into Ukraine and, and taking uh, territory simply because Russia had the power to. Uh, it is up to the United States to lead. I believe, as we learn from Iran, uh, that when the United States leads, eventually the European powers come along and they, they join us. And I think that will ultimately happen. Uh, there is a clear line of division between pre-Crimea and post. Some people are understanding that and they're, they're changing their approach. Others are, are slowly coming to that realization. Uh, this is the pivot point, as I started with, uh, where we are today. And I think if we continue that pivot, we can avoid <coughs> failure. The risks of not doing so are, I think, too high for, for any of us to, to really come to terms with at this point. Okay, Luke, final yep. words? Yep, thank you. Um, Nicholas I, his, uh, his reign was um, is best known for uh, the uh, putting down political dissent, um, presiding over a stagnant economy, uh, territorial expansion, especially in the Caucasus, and uh, finally leading Russia into a war in Crimea. Um, this sounds awfully familiar to, to me today. We regularly say what we're experiencing with Vladimir Putin and Russia today is Cold War behavior, Soviet behavior. This is not Soviet behavior. Um, this is imperial behavior. This is imperial Russian behavior. This is how Russia behaved during the time of the czars before um, the, the Russian Revolution. Um, and uh, in many cases, uh, just as in the 17th and 18th centuries, Russian czars thought that they were taking what was already theirs to have today, Vladimir Putin thinks whether it's intervening in Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Crimea, um, Transnistria, Gaugausia, um, he is taking what he thinks is already his to have. Um, and we need to understand this is his mindset. We also need to appreciate that as because of his experiences during his professional career as a KGB officer um, has shaped how he views Russia's role in the world today. And um, not for reasons you might suspect. He, was a very, he had a very modest career in the KGB. Uh, he attained the rank of lieutenant colonel. During the downfall of the Soviet Union, he was stuck in some backwater posting in Dresden as a major. Mm -hmm. So he was isolated from the crises in, in Moscow and the surrounding areas. He was still committed to the idea that the, the system, the Soviet system did work, that it was superior if it did have the right leadership at the top. And then, he, of course, his, he had a brother who was killed during the siege of Leningrad. So he had this personal connection to the, the Soviet Union's greatest um, moment, right, during, the, during the, uh, the Great Patriotic War. So you combine all this stuff, his mindset, uh, how he views Russia's role in the world, combined with his imperial ambitions, and we, we shouldn't be surprised um, 
we, we see what, we, uh, what happens today. So this is how we should address this problem. Um, so I just, basically my comments are concurring with, with your comments, um, our George and friend here. And uh, we need to realize this isn't Cold War behavior, this is imperial. Thanks. Thank you very much.